Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So, Chris, the first question, when you and I were talking, we, we got into a conversation about what your role is uh, as, a, as a producer. And I think it's, it'd be great to talk about that role. It's a little different than I understood it. And, and Chris can tell you a whole lot more about it. So let's start there. Um, it, it, it's a little confusing in some sense, but it's, uh, uh, as an executive producer in credits, you'll see uh, any number of executive producers. But uh, specifically, what I do as a line producer is it's more commonly known. So once the project is in place, once the money's in place, the director and the studio, or whoever's financing the film, decides to make the film, then I, I come aboard. Essentially, as um, sort of a project manager is a kind of a not great way to describe it, but essentially, uh, the skills that I bring, a producer himself doesn't have, uh, so I sort of organize the production, organize the schedule, uh, can form a plan to the amount of money that's been allocated for the project. So most studios will, will give you a number. They'll say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's 10 or it's 50 or it's 100, whatever it is, and then we take the script and sort of build a battle plan around it, uh, trying to achieve the most you can possibly get out of the finances that are available. So it's, uh, it's a little bit different than uh, the producer himself. In as much as I am a producer, the real true role of a producer is someone who will generate the project, someone who will find the material and find the financing and get it green lit. And at that point, then I'll get a call and, and go on board, so. Let's open it up. Who wants to ask the first question? Well, there, there. I guess I'll tell you a little, a little history of uh, the producing ranks. And Shakespeare in Love won the Academy Award in uh, 2000, let's say, or something. And 20 producers mounted the stage. <laughs> and at that time, there was no organization really representing producers. So a, a group has been formed called the Producers Guild. And steadily, for the last five or ten years, they've gained uh, a foothold in the industry as a legitimate representation for producers. And one of the first things they did was to limit the number of producers who could take credit for a picture. So there's three, essentially. Only three producers are allowed on stage to accept the Oscar. And that was to avoid this idea that people were financing the movie or, you know, like I did The Aviator, Michael Mann was an uh, was executive producer. Michael Mann was going to direct the movie at one time. And he passed the picture along because he decided not to direct it. But when he did that, he said, but I'll take an executive producer credit with it. In the case of Argo, there are six of us as executive producers. Two are financiers, Graham King and his partner Tim Heddington. They basically put in 20% of the budget. They don't really come to the set. A second was the, uh, the person who bought the article. The original article was in Wired magazine. Uh, and David Klawans, uh saw the article and said that might make a great movie. So he bought that. Clooney and his partner went in and bought him out. Part of the deal was, okay, we'll give you $10,000 for the rights to this movie. You can be an executive producer. We'll see you later. Kind of. So then David gets uh, credit as executive producer. The other two uh, executive producers, one works for uh, Ben Affleck's company and one works for Clooney's company. So those five people really don't, um, while they have roles, they're not specifically involved in the production of the film. In that case, it's a line producer. And I suppose 30 years ago, we were line producers and uh, you know, someone said, well, let's make them executive. Executive producers sort of like a grab all, you know, they kind of, but the producer category has been more protected as of late, but the executive producers can go to a lot of different people. Um, and you know, all I know is that there's only one of what I do on, on a picture. No matter how many exec producers there are, there's only one line producer. Okay, next question, yes. Uh, with Can everybody hear the questions okay? A little bit. Can you try to just rephrase the question? Or just yeah, in terms of how do you, how do you, in in my capacity, there's a lot of balls in the air, and how do I how do I navigate them? Um, I think the first and foremost is the director. You're sort of paying attention, really, to because a director is all of us here who are interested in movies know they're really the author of the movie. So in as much as I have the financier over my shoulder making sure that he's happy and that the money's well spent, I have to basically listen to his priorities and try to uh, line up our agenda with his priorities. So if, if Ben Affleck thinks that it's important that we shoot in Istanbul as opposed to Morocco, which was a decision we had to make on Argo, 
then I have to factor that into the planning of the, of the movie and be responsive to what he's thinking about. But basically also, you have a t as, as a person responsible for the money, you have uh, individuals you're giving, you're dividing up the money. It's like a pie chart. So you're giving your construction team two and a half million dollars, your set dressing team a million, your costumes 750,000. You basically have, have uh, all these people have track records. All of them have reputations. And you can quite easily and quite quickly find out this person's terrific, this person's a nightmare. And you have to, you, you have to really, because the job in a, the film industry is kind of a unique environment because it combines skills that other industries don't. For example, a costume designer, production designer, even a, what we call a DP, a director of photography, they have to manage money and they have to be artists. So it's a different craft and requires different skill sets than just being an artist or, or just being good with money. If you're, if, you're, if you're just one of those and not both, then my job as a manager becomes more difficult. So you, you try to figure out who, who has the most money and if that person comes, because I don't always choose these folks. Some people work with a director, come to the project. And they're, 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 my, they're my, you know, I have to babysit them. And I have to be sure that they're not, um, it, I'll, I'll know ahead of time if they're going to be a problem. And I'll just sit on them. And I'll just keep an eye on them. And also what is required from my job is sort of diplomacy. Because you're working with, again, you're working with artists, you're working with people who, who if a director brings along a production designer who has been nominated a bunch of times and is really strong, he might also have the ear and the trust of the director. So in terms of how I deal with them, it's important that it's done in the right way. It, it, it's, yeah, I can't really cause problems. I have to make sure that I'm trying to keep that person, you know, sort of not under my thumb, but I have to know what's going on. Because foreknowledge is how we deal with, for, you, you want to know what's going to happen before it happens. So. Can you talk a little bit about being on set um, in New Orleans? You told me some stories. I don't know how, how, well, you, how direct or, or how much you want to talk about. But I don't have a lot stories. of funny stories. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had them. Very but, interesting stories. But uh, Dante Ferretti is a uh, um, production designer who works with Martin Scorsese all the time. And he actually did five films with Fellini. And he worked with Pierre Pasolini. I mean, he's a legend. And he's been, I think he's been nominated 10 or 12 times or something. And uh, he's very charming and very smart. and. Uh, you know, he's sort of uh, the Babe Ruth of uh, production designers. Anyway, in New Orleans, we were making Interview with the Vampire, and I was a production manager, and uh, he, uh, we were working in Jackson Square at night, and it was cobblestones, and he wanted to put dirt down across the square. So uh, I, was, I was thinking about what that meant, because Jackson Square is a heavily populated place, and so to put dirt down seemed like a big deal, and I had cobblestones, so I said to Dante, seems okay, right? I mean, cobblestones, 1790s, that, that'll work, won't it? And they said, Chris, I don't understand. I, I do a good Dante. <laughs> if, you knew, if you knew Dante. Chris, I don't understand why, what is the problem with the dirt? I don't, I don't, don't know what you, you know, because he was looking like I was crazy. What's I said, well, Dante, just think about it. I mean, the, you know, that, that's, if it rains, which it did, it'll turn to mud, and the, the cleanup is going to be a nightmare. And he goes, ah, now, Chris, I understand. For me, it, now it's clear. It, it is not the image that lives forever. No, it's a cleanup. Okay, now. <laughs> okay, now, now. <laughs> so you, uh, you know, you learn, uh, you learn the hard way sometimes. Mm -hmm. Be careful. So. Who's next? Who's family? Um, where did you go to school, and did you study film when you were in I went to Stetson University without a clue about what I was going to do in life. I studied marketing uh, up until my uh, uh, senior year, and I had an elective, and a friend of mine said, uh, there's this film appreciation class, what do you think? I was like, oh, you yeah, know, sure. And I walked in, the, in that room, it was kind of changed my life, really, because I, I, didn't, I didn't really, I didn't have any idea that, the, that movies like the kind that I saw existed, you know, with Bergman and Fellini and Kurosawa and all those things. It was just a new an exciting world that I was unfamiliar with. You know, I didn't look at Chaplin and Keaton as artists. I didn't, I didn't see it. And then I saw it and I said, well, that seems like a great industry uh, as opposed to banking, insurance, or something that I was headed for. I didn't, you know, it just was really appealing to me. So it was just luck. And then I happened to move into New York with some friends and, you know, as we talked about, I just started as a production assistant, uh, you know, which wasn't, you know. And in New York, you know, a lot of young people, I don't know anyone here who's studying film or anything, but 
you know, today that's geared a little bit differently than it was for me because I, you know, we just didn't know there was development, which is really where you go if you want to produce, direct, write. You know, you go to you go to California. That's really, or you can go to New York. But if you're in New York, it's primarily production work. So I kind of started my career thinking I I wanted to produce and be a producer, not a line producer. But I kind of got on a track that um, I developed the skills at managing movies and that just became kind of what I did, what I enjoy and still do, so, I, yeah. Yes, sir. As a line producer, I understand that you also give them exact time, how many days of shooting. Yes. You do that and, and the money, is, of course, is uh, implemented in it. And um, I understand that uh, if something goes wrong, and then you uh, over the budget. Yes. I understand that there is an insurance company basically that over that sees basically and uh, make sure that everything is in order. So what happens when you over budget? Well, there's there's two ways films are financed. One is with a studio, which does not have what you're referring to. That's a bond company. What you're referring to, independent films often. That, that will have a bond company in place. And the bond company is essentially, as you say, they can come in at some point, and I've worked with bond, bonded films before, uh, that uh, they have power over the production. If you're going over, they can come in and say, okay, look, you don't need this, this, and this. We're, we're, we're wrapping you up next Tuesday. Uh, you're, you're finished. It rarely happens that way, though, because you know, you're, you're, you're not shooting in order. You're not, you, your shooting may not be complete. So it's kind of a false power, in essence. It's a threat, but it's rarely acted upon in earnest. It's meant to try to limit the damage as opposed to like just drop, you know, just drop them and stop them because you can't, you know, your, your, your movie's not complete. I understand it in Yankel with Barbara Streisand, that's what happened and she put five million dollars on her own sure. money to do it. Well that could have been the threat. The, the threat was there, you know, somebody said look we're going to shut you down and you're not going to have the scene that you wanted, yeah. you know, some, and so she said well I think it's important enough to put but the they, money down. they blame the line manager? <laughs> well I think you're, you, you have to, yeah, you go into it with the, with the idea that you can be blamed, but you can protect yourself. I mean, uh, essentially you have to be open with everybody. You know, what I usually do is I just make sure everybody's up, you know, is clear. And also you can see, for example, if a director's going over schedule, you know, you've scheduled the movie for 60 days, you have 12 hours a day. If he's not making his days, because each day has a day's work, you know, he's seen four and six on Monday, and, you know, if he doesn't make scene four and six and it carries over the next day, the people who are paying for it, whether it's a studio or the bond company, they see it. So it's not really, I don't really control the director. So I have an out. But you can still mismanage as a line producer and, and take, you know, take heat. I mean, but usually, again, all of us, it's a very small industry really. I mean, what I do, there's probably 30 or 40 of us, maybe 20 that really work a lot. And we all have reputations and, and it's really important how you conduct yourself because there are seven studios, and they all talk. You know, everybody knows everybody. You just picked up the phone, had Chris doing the last show, and they and then, so you, you know, you, you don't, you know, you, you have to have real common sense about how you conduct yourself, uh, particularly since you're dealing with money, and you know your your reputation is really important. You know, are you, are you straight up, or you, you know, you bend the truth, you know, that kind of stuff. You have to be. Because, you, because, for example, going back to the, to the idea of production designers and doling out money, so you know, you're giving a production designer two and a half million dollars, he never really sees your budget. He doesn't really know, right? That, 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 that's our plan. That's how we see fit how to divide the money up. And, the, and it goes to days, too, you know, because you're, when you get, let's say Argo, Argo is 47 million. So you have to, you have to construct a plan around that. And, and what a director wants is shooting time. So you start with, 55 days, I can't do it in 55 days. I need 62. And so you begin to negotiate, but if you're going to pay for 62, I got to take some from somewhere else to keep it. You know, so it's just sort of, it moves. But of course, I have a team that works with me. It's not like I do it myself. You know, we, there, there's a lot of experience that comes with, it's not that hard once you get into it and do it. It just, like I said, a lot of it, I think, is from my point of view, it's not so much the numbers as, as the interaction and working with people. Because each time I work, I might, I'll work with a different group of people. It's not always the same people. And uh, that means, you know, this guy, you know, it, it, everyone's different, you know. So you have to find a way to get along with everybody and keep the studio happy, keep the director happy. One of the things I told Jim, which I think is the hardest thing for me, is 
because I have the money, and the director doesn't know what that money is either. I mean, he knows, but he doesn't really know. So if I say I can't, we can't afford a set, or we only have 59 days, he questions me. Why? Why is that? I need it. I have to, have, you know, find it. I, we only have enough money for 100 extras. I mean, one of the big things in Argo was, you know, the background uh, out in, in, we shot in Istanbul, and the big demonstrations in front of the embassy there, we turned out, uh, uh, you know, Affleck didn't want to do what a lot of films would do, which would be just uh, do crowd duplication, you know, because the, the great th the, one of the great economies of making movies today is you can take 50 people and make them 5,000, you know, it's easy. You just keep moving around the street and you, you lock off your camera and you change a couple of shirts and it works. But he wanted, he wanted the street full. He said, no, it, it, it's going to have a feel that's important for me and for the movie that we have a full street. So. Um, but, you know, we, we turned out 1,300 people that day, so that's, uh, but, you know, you have to really, and there was pressure because at one point we weren't sure we were going to get that many, and so <coughs> one of the producers came and said, well, let's pay them all more. Let's, let's give them all more money. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, no, that's a bad move because, <laughs> you know, because it, it, it's not a house of cards, this budget, but it's a plan. It's a, it's a, it's a plan that has not a lot of flexibility once it's set, so you can't really just suddenly spend another $50,000 a day on extras because those extra, you know, it, it just, it's a sort of a, uh, yeah. Let's go over here. Yes. Uh, in choosing location, how, how much do you consider the uh, tax credit? Uh, uh, <laughs> the tax credit uh, as an issue, it's a very good question. It, it, it's, a, uh, it's a guiding uh, principle of the film industry now to go where tax credits are, if possible. I mean, I, I'm not sure what South Carolina is at the moment, but uh, it's it's right now it's New Orleans and Georgia and New York are are three of North the Carolina. North Carolina, yes, yeah, and the the tax credits are. I, I must say, as someone who utilizes them all the time, and I've listened to a lot of the research, the state and the state governments that are researching these, it still it seems to be up in the air a little bit that they actually they actually work for the state. Like, uh, I think. We're a great industry, and people think we're a great industry because we're eco-friendly. We come in and we spend a lot of money and we leave. So, but places like, you know, New Mexico, when when the, when the governor changes, the state tax credit can change. So, for example, the the new governor in New Mexico didn't, you know, they have fiscal problems, so she changed the plan. Now they had studios built there. They had a, they had a thriving local industry. Uh, Detroit, same thing. Detroit had a very generous tax credit. Michigan, which again, change of governor, change of tax credit. So it it. Uh, New York has, has just extended its tax credit out to, I think, to 2016 or 17, which gives, you know, continuity to the, to the, uh, to the state. Whereas in California, they have a, a very, I, I can only say cockamamie system of a, of a limited, limited amount of money that is a lottery system. So if you come to North Carolina or, and just get in line, you can, get, you, can, you can qualify. If you go to California, you have to have your name pulled out of like a hat, and it's kind of, it's a hard way to, to plan a movie if you don't know that you're absolutely going to get the tax credit. So, um, can you just explain a little bit about how you um, come on to a project? Like, are you, like, what your, because you said that as a line producer, sometimes you come in and the director and the executive, or the, um, I guess the financial producers are already intact. Like, how do you come to the project? Um, well, I have an agent. Uh, everybody who does what I does has an agent. In fact, my agent represents all my competition. You know, so we're we're all known. It, it's not you know, but some of us are right for some things and not right for other things. And 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 he knows that, and the studios kind of know that because that's principally where the work comes from. And uh, you go in for an interview. If you if you haven't, you try to get your name. You know, I'm always paying attention. He is for things that he knows I would like to do. Unfortunately, I have been really successful in finding good movies lately. So now I'm on a good movie trend, which I'm, we're not making that many these days. It's hard to find an Argo. It's hard to find a Shutter Island or an Inception. There, there are many more uh, uh, comic book movies than there are, you know, sort of meaty kind of things you really want to get your, you know, you really enjoy, things you want to see yourself kind of things. So I went in for an interview. With Affleck, I had to go interview. And uh, originally, I'm just trying to think Inception I had to go interview with Nolan. So, uh, you know, you just you do your homework and you get ready and you go give it your best shot. And again, I think going back to the idea of reputation, I think <laughs> those interviews are always backed up by your reputation. So, yes? Uh, I'm interested in post-production. How much are you involved after the shooting? Uh, no, have, you, have you moved on? I have, yes. There isn't anything yes. for you to kind of do? Or 
Yeah, because the skills that I have are, are it's, there's not enough work for me in post-production. Uh, some guys stay on, like Michael Bay's producer, but then he only works with Michael Bay, uh, kind of thing. But if, for me, it's, you know, we go down from a very large, expensive daily cost to like five people in the editing room. You know, it's very small. There's really, and they're going to do that for six months. And they have a visual effects producer on all these films that kind of, you know, they have, they have enough supervisory talent that uh, I move on. Let's do this. I'll repeat the questions. Uh, I know some of you are having a hard time here, so um, ask the question. I'll repeat it, and then Chris can answer it next. Yes, sir. What advice would you have for a new graduate trying to break into the industry? So the question is, what advice would you have for a new graduate trying to break into the industry? Um, I'm asked that question a lot, which is, uh, you know, it's a good, it's a good uh, question. I mean, the first thing is, um, depending on what they want to do, I think you have to go. Uh, most young people today are not interested in being grips or electrics or sound people or camera people. They want to be writers, directors, producers. So for that, pretty much, I think you have to go to Los Angeles. I mean, I think that's your first step. And then the. I actually have a son who's out in Los Angeles who's in the camera department, but he, you know, when he first started, I really didn't know uh, the, the procedure for young people in California, but they're all trying to, they work at agencies as interns, they'll work at production, they, you know, you just, and I think the main thing about finding a job, and, you know, I took my son into, uh, uh, to NYU where he didn't go, but we, you know, we sat in a room full of kids, I mean, all going, you know, wanting to be in the film industry, it was quite intimidating, and I said, you know, it's, yes, it's intimidating, but at the same time, most of the people in that room, sadly, say will not be in the film industry because the, I think the skills required aren't just a love of movies. It can't be you just love movies. You're, you're competing in a, in a field that's attracting really bright, aggressive kids. You know, it's like you, you have to have a little bit more than just a, a love of movies. Now, talent can carry you a long way. And, you know, people want to be composers or cinematographers or animators. Then maybe what, maybe the, because in my world, I have to be uh, a little bit more, I don't want to say aggressive, but you, ha you know, you're competing. So it's like, if I want that job, i got to go in and hit it hard, and I can't be passive. And in a room full of people, there are passive people. So it's hard for everybody to kind of, you know, like I, I was talking to my son yesterday, and he's, he's uh, it's sort of, I had to remind him that, you know, because he's, he's a camera PA, right, a produ production assistant, and he wants to be a DP. I, I said, look, when I started, I did three years of industrials. It's like a five-man crew. Then I was a PA, and then I was a location assistant. Then I was a location man. It takes time. It takes time to build a career, and it doesn't happen overnight. And not everybody has the staying power for that. You know, it, it can be discouraging. It can be, you know, you have to, you have to hang in there. And the only thing I tell young people is, keep hanging in there because, you know, there are people falling by the wayside. As you, each day you stay with it, someone else is out of the business. And it sounds a little tough, and it's not, it's not really that tough. You just have to embrace it. You have to, you know, guys, it's a little different today for kids because they're all, you know, everyone texts. And they, like, I keep even bringing my son, but you know, he didn't like the phone because he never used it. You know, he never really talked on the phone much. The kids, his phone bill was always one minute for like five, <laughs> 500 calls a month, and they're all a minute. I, I never figured it out, but you know, it's it, when I came up, I was very comfortable with the phone. I was very comfortable with letters, and I, I, I had no problem. Hey, how you doing? Look, I'm just looking for work. You know, blah, 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 you know, and so that's kind of the thing I'd say. If you, you know, just know you're going into this environment, be prepared for that, and and uh, you know, go, you know, go for it. You know, and and it's like anything else. I think that that uh, because the business is attracting so many young people, you know, you just have to stay positive all the time. You know, you know, the kid that. Yeah, sure, whatever you need, you know, 24 hours a day, whatever, sure, whatever, you, that, that kid's going to stick with you and you're going to probably give him a bump and it's all basics really in terms of how to get ahead in any, any industry, I think it's. Over here? Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned a lot about reputation, so do you have any basic tips about how to guard your reputation? Yeah, yeah, so the question is, she says, you mentioned a lot about reputation, do you have any advice about how to guard your reputation? Yeah, I think you adhere to your your common sense values, you know, right? You, you never lie. That's the first thing. Because in our business, there's a lot of it. You know, there's a. <laughs> but you know, those are agents like, oh yeah, you know, like I got Tom Cruise. He loves his script. He read. He wants to do it. No, not true. <laughs> he never read it. He doesn't want to do it. But he's, you know. But in my my line of work, uh, it's more, um, you know, those people that you're telling you have two and a half million in construction. If it's not true, they can find out. 
you know, because I made mistakes when I was younger. When I like, you make everyone's deal. You know, everyone in this room, I would personally have to make your deal. So you're coming in at seventeen dollars an hour, and you say, well, geez, I, you know, seventeen. I'm really, I got eighteen in my last year. I said, everyone's getting seventeen. Okay, well, if everyone's getting seventeen, then you walk around the corner. It happened to me all the time. You turn and go, you look. What do you get? Eighteen. You know what I mean? So that kind of thing. You can't mess around like that. You have to be straight up with people. And actually, it comes back twofold. Because there's so much of that in the business that when someone's actually straight with you, they're like, oh man, that guy walks on water. He's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you get a really good reputation by just being straight with people and treating them the right way and you know, doing your best because it's, it's, it sounds sort of altruistic and you know, but really it's about keeping your career going, you know, in a way. Because you want people to come back and say, oh, he's great. Because you know, when I interviewed for Inception, you know, I mean, you know, they called ten people. You know, they called everybody I had worked with in the last four years. And so, you know, the first guy that says, you know, what he, he was late to work, he drank too much, he, you know, he, he, he anything could be anything. It could be, you know, flirting with the office staff. I mean, not to get, you know, I mean, but that kind of thing. Everything about it's just common sense. You just go and you do your job, and you know, and and uh, and then have to do it well after you get your values in order, you know, but. Yes. So, how often do you or the main people you work with have like a aha, aha, aha moment? Like you're, you're in the film, you're halfway through and you go, aha, this is going to be far better than we thought. Or aha, this isn't working. So, you know, it's funny, the question is, so how often do you, uh, in the middle of a production, have an aha moment where you either say, aha, this is going to be great, or aha, this is not going to be great? Uh, I actually never uh, <laughs> have those because I'm always, I, even with Argo, I mean, you know, I was, I went to work with Ben Affleck because I thought the town and Gone Baby Gone were terrific, you know, and showed that he had talent and skill and he was the best job available at that time. And I thought, well, this is going to be, I want to work with him. So when I read Argo, I thought, yeah, it's going to be great, but I kind of felt there was a sort of a, when I read the script, I said, well, you know, it sort of seems to, you know, the phone rings and the, and he, oh, they're at the door, the door's locked, oh, the, 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 the truck doesn't, you know, this had this sort of thing. I thought, I don't know if it's going to work, you know, if it's going to, people are going to buy it, it's going to be like, oh, yeah, sure, the door doesn't work, you know, and, oh, and now, the, you know. So um, I always keep a distance from saying, oh, it's going to be great or it's going to be terrible, because I never know. I, it's hard to tell. I mean, in Argo, I think the, the editorial job he did, I just didn't, it, I didn't see it coming. I thought it was terrific, you know. I mean, now that you see it, it's kind of obvious. You have Hollywood. And, Iran with the serious stuff and DC with the CIA and the it sort of bounces off each other in such a great way, but I didn't know he was going to edit that way. So, um, I, I in my role I kind of I try to go I try to attach myself to the best director, the best talent, and then because that's you're like betting on a horse, you know. You're just you try to ride it and hope it hope it delivers really. So. Um, some people say you have a really great sense of humor. But in all seriousness, how has that helped you in your career dealing with the different personalities? And, um, I just think it's tension breaker, you know? You just break tension because uh, in, in, um, in my role as a line producer, I'm, I'm, I'm really the only one that has this kind of a job in the production. The director, and I, and I, and I talk about the production designer, costume designer, director of photography, they're all there to service the director and to spend as much money as they want to make it as big as they can. You know, in the case of like, like Scorsese, all his team, the five key creative people, those, they're all together with him. They're like, they're like over there, and they're all supporting him, and they're all incredibly talented, and they're all multi-Oscar nominees. I'm the guy that's sort of, I'm the no guy. I'm, 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 or as Ben, this was a good one. Ben Affleck referred to me as the dream killer. <laughs> Uh, but in a sense, that, that's the perception of what I do. So in order to try to, um, you know, I always want to, we who do what I do, men and women, we all want to be on the inside of that world. We, we don't want to be seen as dream killers. We want to be seen as, as really um, contributing to the creative vision of the director with, with our own personal responsibility. So anyway, humor is just, you just use it to keep the tension down because I'm constantly, uh, you know, Everyone needs more all the time, and you basically can you can only give them so, you know so much and stay within your your budget and within your responsibility. Yes, dear. I wanted to ask you what was going through your mind while you were waiting for 
room to film because I was watching your face and saw your eyes moving and I thought his mind is going a million miles an hour. So to give us a feeling for what a producer thinks about, can you tell us what was going through your mind then? What was going through your mind now? Did you all hear that? Oh, no, I just said uh, it's, look, I, I'm not, uh, only in the last couple of years that uh, my resume has been built up have I been lucky enough to be invited to something like this. And I enjoy doing it because it's easy to talk about something that you know. If I was to, you know, uh, maybe have to talk about something else, I'd be more nervous. But I, I, I happen to, you know, it's, it's great. I, people are interested in the business. And, you know, my wife Wendy is here with me. And we, we have a lot of friends back in Connecticut. And they're all, you know, it's a funny thing about the movie business. People are just fascinated with the movie business. and. Um, no matter what room you're in, somebody wants to, you know, so I enjoy it. I mean, I was, I don't know if I was, uh, maybe I was just processing uh, my nerves. And <clears throat> Always. <laughs> yeah, we're walking down the street here in Charleston. I'm like, you think? Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, in reference to you being a dream killer, quote unquote, do you ever find yourself struggling with bias and like when allocating money to certain, I guess, production agencies or people? Do you ever have like a tendency to devote more money to what you personally like? That's a great question, actually. Uh, do I personally redirect money to areas that I think? Uh, this is sort of what I was talking to Jim about on the phone because I, I think. In terms of, I don't see how I can word this best, but in terms, of, I, this sort of, there's a sort of a hidden quality to what I do, which even directors aren't aren't fully cognizant of, which is that just precisely what you're talking about, not quite like a bias, but I guess there is a point where what I think is important to the movie, I can redirect monies to, yes, so that, but it's generally sort of well after what I think the director wants, because first of all, he'll know. I mean, I have to be. You know, I mean, I have to live with myself, so I can't really sort of secretly have a new agenda about how the movie should really be done, you know? I have to really be responsive to what the director wants. But I do have the ability to, if I think he's on the wrong track, or she, or whatever, if, if, if I, I, can, I, can, I can sort of favor things. Not with a lot, but with a little, yeah, I can. And I, and I hopefully, I do that with a clear conscience and the idea that I'm making the picture better. I believe that I'm making the picture better. I don't do it, I, you know, I, I think I, see, I have more information about the movie than almost anybody except what the director, like in Affleck's case, let's just say, go back to him again, you know, he had a vision for the movie. He's not sharing that whole vision with me, why he cast somebody or why he emphasizes this scene or, but in terms of the physical production, for example, in Istanbul, you know, they may have wanted a lot, like I said, this idea about giving a bunch more money to the extras. Yeah, I knew we could overcome that without giving the money to the extras, and I also knew the picture would suffer if we did it. So I wasn't going to give that money over to the extras easily because I would have to take out, you know, 25 of the 50 cars we had on the street. It's not a direct correlation, but it's something like that. But our director, and listen, it's fair, fair play, as they say. He, he can simply say, look, the budget's his problem. It's not my problem, you know. As long as I stay on schedule, if he goes over, they're not coming after me, they're going to go after him. You know what I mean? He'll be the one in trouble. So we, everybody sort of knows what everybody does. We're all sort of watching our own corner. You try to get as cooperative as you can, but I do, I do have the ability and I do put money where I think it belongs despite what other influences might be pressuring me. So. Yeah, that almost speaks to, the, to my question, which was how often do you work with directors that are sensitive to the budget and, to, and also to what they need, or do they see you as an adversary? Uh, they do see me as an adversary uh, in one sense, yes, uh, because you're, I I'm the only limitation they have. Producers uh, will tend to, and I, and I mean this in the, the best possible way, that, you know, we're a tool for them as well. You know, we'll, we, we are like the speed bumps, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll, be the, we'll be the bad guys, we'll take the heat. We'll go and say, you can't afford something, and then they'll go back and say, oh, God, Chris, I know, he's like, same thing all the time, no, no you know, so it's, but it's a, it's a known environment. People know what you're doing. And I think that, uh, um, but directors generally, if they're, if, if they're too budget conscious, then the movie suffers. They have to be tough. I mean, that's the thing about directors. They're all tough, you know, they're, because they are, it, it is a Ben Affleck movie. It's not a Chris Brigham movie. You know, if it, if it fails, he's criticized. If it succeeds, he gets the credit. He deserves it. So, um, you know, we're there to support 
them as best we can within our professional responsibilities. And I always say that because it means I can't just spend more because he wants it. You know, and he has to know that. They have to know that. They have to appreciate that. You know, I was hired for a reason. It's like I can't just turn my back on the budget. I can't just ignore it because he wants more. I have to, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, how much does other experience or just other knowledge of like the other areas of production, like you know, the camera or the, uh, the, the casting, how much does knowledge of those areas help you? Or, you know, so could you all hear that? Yeah. yeah. The question was how much does knowledge, uh, knowledge of cameras and cats and the other parts of the production, how much of that do you need to know? How does that affect you? I'd say there's certain areas which I wish I knew more about. That I was more. I'm not a technical person, so because the because the film industry is so uh, using visual effects so much, um, it would be it would it would help to know a little bit more about that if I had an aptitude for it or an interest in it. But I'm not, so I, I get by without it. Um, and for the most part, the other areas I know enough about the other areas to to the key thing really is what I talked about earlier is like if you're if you're going to be uh, doing the costumes and you know I don't need to know whether you're making them or renting them I just need to know that you can do it for the amount of money I gave you and that you know and then the, the, the actual interpretation of what the director wants you'll probably work more closely with him so but, but I have to know that you're you know you're going to deliver or you're not either way I just have to but I'm not going to influence I won't it won't matter to me whether I guess it would help if I could go to you and say well could you build that do you have to do you have to rent them or do you have to build them can you rent them that kind of thing so Yes, sir. Um, in reference to you know, no other projects you've been working on, uh, no pun intended, but there's a, a flood of Bible-inspired uh, films that are coming out in the near future. How are, how is your film kind of going to stand? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I think the uh, obviously Darren Aronofsky's version will be different than uh, than the Bible miniseries, for example. You know, it's going to be a, a different because of who he is and his take on things, and uh, so. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Didn't I see, isn't Scorsese working on a uh, Bible-related? I don't know, to be honest with you. Yeah. Okay. I heard, I just think Aronofsky, because if you look at his movies, they're, you know, they're very creative, and mm -hmm. he's going he's gonna to put something into it, which is, I don't know if it's going to be controversial, potentially controversial, but uh, I think it's, you know, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be different, you know, it'll look different, it'll feel different. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a director you haven't worked with that you would like to? The question is, is the director you haven't worked with who you'd like to? Um, I mean, you know, there's a, there's, I think, I think Ang Lee is somebody that, you know, it's great. I mean, Catherine, anybody you just saw, Catherine Bigelow, I think would be great to work with. I mean, these are, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's talented directors out. Peter Weir is somebody I almost worked with. It's, you know, um, Wes Anderson. I mean, any you know those kind of people. I mean, whoever you think of the top ten directors, I'd love to work with any of them. You know, and I really, I know you know I don't. Uh, some of them are difficult, and that wouldn't bother me uh, at all because it, it's just you know you want to be. What I found is you want to be associated with the best films you can be associated with. You know. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Someone from the outside texted me a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, out there somewhere. Um, <laughs> Wesley wanted to know what is life like. Could you just give us a sense of what daily life is like on uh, on a production? Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, for example, um, let's take Noah. We brought up Noah. So we were shooting in Iceland uh, last summer, and and uh, it, Iceland doesn't have a lot of filmmaking. So there's uh, there's there's a there's a sort of a, and it has a lot of weather. So. Typically, for me, in a day, you have a seven o'clock start in the morning. We all arrive. We know what the work is for the day, and then uh, as problems develop during the day, I'm there to kind of uh, maintain calm, maintain sensible planning, keep people from panicking because it's starting to drizzle, and pack up all the trucks and let's move down the street because the drizzle is going to leave in an hour. And essentially, you're just monitoring not just the day's problems, but what's coming up the rest of the week and the next month. So you're, you're moving the next day, you want to make sure that everybody's ready to go, that you know, this location's ready, someone broke in, get a, you know, broke a set, you got to get it fixed. It's just a kind of a, it's troubleshooting uh, the whole time, basically. Lots of anticipation. So. Yes, yes, and there's a team in place for all of that. You just, uh, you know, there's a big group of us that we all work together, and, but it's essentially just trying to keep the train on the tracks, trying to keep it stable and moving forward and making your day. I mean, it's important to make your day. On Noah, we had days where we were spending $850,000 a day. So that's a lot if you go over, if you miss it, you know, and, and uh, 
that's where the studio, in this case Paramount, you know, they're very keen to make sure that there's a steady hand at the helm. And it's not supposed to be the director per se, it's a team around him. The producer first, and then me, but usually the studio knows that most of what's happening in terms of logistically is going through me. So um, I'm in daily contact with the studio, and they're calling me, how's it going today? Did you, you know, we have targets before lunch, after lunch. If you go long, you have to come, you know, it's unionized, everything's unionized, so there's, you know, there's an hourly cost to everything, and so, and if you're shooting day to day, let's say we're in Charleston Monday and we're going to be outside in the square, we got to finish by 7 o'clock at night, sun goes down. If we don't finish, we're back there the next day, but we don't have access to the square because it's locked, you know, say you only got one day. So it's this kind of stuff where you're, that's where it gets tough with the director because you're, the pressure's back on them to finish these days and you're standing there like this. As my son likes to call it, pressure presence. <laughs> I get very tall. Chris, how do you handle stress when you're on a production? Do you bring your family, do you travel your family with you? How have you handled it over the years? I think it's, uh, I think it's, um, uh, you know, it's just uh, experience probably, you, you know. Able to break out for a, a jog or I run, yeah, I run. I do, yeah, and uh, you know, but uh, the weekends, the mornings and stuff, I'm a pretty avid runner. I think that's definitely part of it, and, and I also, uh, you know, I like, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I like sports, so I, uh, I use the analogy of a, of a good coach, you know, yeah, I'm not a screamer, so, and I think that when I have lost my temper, I have let go, which I don't, it discredits you, you know, because you're supposed to be in charge. So directors can go crazy and stuff like that, but I, I think it's imp I can only do my job the way I do it, is, which is, which is a, with a calm demeanor for the most part. Uh, when I've lost my temper before, I found that if, for example, I, I can still remember a makeup artist, you know, was uh, early in my career, and I, and I got right into it with her about something. And like a half an hour later, I needed her to get an actor ready in no time. And I had to go and ask her for something, and you know, it's like, forget it. So you just learn. <laughs> You just learn that that's not, that's not, if your goal is to be successful, then you have to control that in a way that, uh, you know, you don't let it get the better of you. But in terms of stress, I think it's like anybody else, you're, you have outlets, you know, you have ways to do that. So. How much time do you take on each project? Pretty much as much time as uh, the next good project comes along, you know what I mean? It's, uh, I try to uh, just, I'm not, I'm a little picky, but, uh, uh, you know, I have to work, so I wait. Like now, I've been out for four months. It's not unusual, and uh, hopefully, I'll be back at work in the next uh, month or so. Right back here, and then I think we have one here next. Just a point of information: there are tax breaks in South Carolina, right. uh, and that's what Jack Lonnie was. He paid years. But that's what they did. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the dialogue and the harmony that you need between me and the director, particularly on the matter of pages to be done in a day, that kind of thing. Um, there isn't always harmony, uh, and there isn't always direct communication. I mean, uh, sometimes um, directors, I mean, in, in the case of like Scorsese, he's, you know, he, he's, you know, I always think of him as sort of like Picasso, you know, and he has his own way of working. And he doesn't respond to pressure presence. He doesn't, it doesn't, and so I have to be, I have to adjust how I work with different people. In his case, you know, he's an artist, he's a great artist, and if me being near around him, distracts him, like he's trying to focus on his work, but he sees me, and if he sees me and he feels like, I gotta hurt, you know, like, uh, you know it's, I get the message, so I have to just do some things differently. So it's not always, you, I have to adapt. They're, they're really the boss, so I'm, I'm sort of, whoever that person is, I have to respond to them. R rarely do I dictate the relationship. The relationship is, you know, I try to make it work for how I can be most effective with that person, but it's not always the way I would choose to have it. Done. You know, it's a. It, it can be different in every case. As it, back then. Yes, sir. And then you got them back. Very, very far back. Just wondering how long it takes for you to actually enjoy the films that you've worked on, to enjoy them as a film. I do. Think about it, you know, you do. Uh, I pretty much I do. I I, you know, I saw Argo and I really you know I thought it was terrific. I enjoyed it all and you know obviously I see things and it reminds me of what we were doing that day and where we were and things like that. But uh, for the most part, I you know. I find myself choking up at the right places and, you know, <laughs> chuckling at the right place. I, you know, I fall into it, just like that's what the great thing about movies is. There is a, obviously something that this side looks at it and thinks, oh, that was a crazy day and we barely got out of there and, you know, so. 
you and then you. So you go ahead. Um, my question was, what is one of the, if you can think of, the greatest hurdles that you've had to get over, the greatest challenges on a specific film or moment in your career? Um, in case you figure, what were the greatest challenges uh, in your career? Well, I've had bad moments. I mean, you know, there are bad moments. You know, on uh, Interview with a Vampire, I mean, this is kind of a silly story, but I mean, it was emotional to me at the time. I was, I was a production manager in New Orleans. My son was... You know, I had my wife and my, my children there, and he was going to first grade, first semester in New Orleans. And uh, Interview with the Empire was a mass, massive movie. It was well before visual effects were really in place. So, you know, we had, and it was a big job for me. It was a really big job for me. And um, uh, we, had a, we had a generator that was making noise all the time. And Tom Cruise was really upset about it. And he kept bringing it up. And, uh, uh, we tried to repair it, you know, we tried to baffle it and all this kind of stuff. We were working out in, in the woods and you could hear everything, you know. And so if this generator was a mile away humming, Cruz could hear it. And, you know, he said, look, if I hear the generator again, I'm not coming to work. That's, you know, and so it got serious. You know, he just, he, he didn't want to, because what it meant was he'd have to loop, the, loop his di uh, dialogue. He wanted his dialogue in the environment. It's not an unreasonable request. So we baffled the thing, and you know I had guys every night who would go and baffle it, and you know I wasn't thinking about it, and it rained, and the baffles got wet, and they didn't put the baffles on. And uh, someone came up to me at uh, like 11 o'clock at night, and I, you know, I was working from eight to midnight every day, you know, it was like long hours, and uh, said, hey, you know, those baffles aren't on there. And I said, you're kidding me. So I, you know, I went crazy. Get the baffles on, you know? Okay, yeah, we got it, we got it, we got it. And I went home, and I got a call at three in the morning. Director wants you on set right now. The cruise has walked off. You know, and I, I was sitting at the kitchen table. I was almost in tears. It was like a bad, it was bad. So, I, you know, it's um, things like that. I mean, just the normal pressures of, of uh, meeting expectations than, uh, than anything else. It's uh, uh, trying to have, you know, uh, a, a, a smooth running operation where, you, you know, you, your feet aren't on the fire, you know. You and then you. Uh, the way that communication has changed over the last 20 years, has that changed your job with the way that you are hands on with the project? Uh, do you need to not be around as much? Or? I'm around. I'm around all the time because if I'm not, someone else is going to make the decision. Which so, you know, a lot of people think of. Uh, of I say, let's say, talk for myself as a control freak, but you really have. I feel like you really need to be. It, you know, have your fingers on everything because the slightest thing goes out of whack, and you, you know you got to pull it back and repair it. Like there is a plan and agenda. I think communication is obviously only a lot better. Things are much faster and quicker, and you can do things. It's also, you know, it's also all of us who do emails. It's also something you have to be very careful of as well, right? Because I think kids today in social media and the way they were sending texts and sex to all this kind of crazy stuff. You know, we were sending emails out, saying things, and they just get forwarded. So I think you, everyone's very careful about that kind of stuff. But in terms of day-to-day -day operation, I think it's the same hand, hands-on management and being there at the time. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, when the decision to film Argo took place, was there any discussion about or concern that revealing that story might negatively impact other government operations? I don't think so. I, I, uh, as far as the film impacting other government operations, not to my knowledge. I think it was a historical event that, that for the most part, was told accurately to some, 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 you know, some movie enhancements. But essentially, I think that story, you know, stood on its own. I mean, we we did film in Istanbul, and there was some concern. We were trying to find Iranian actors because you may or may not. And I'm sure most of you do that. Turkish is not Farsi, and. They look different, they, it's different language, different everything. So we had to basically turn Istanbul into Tehran. But the local Iranians were reluctant to be part of the project because of their, any uh, retribution that would happen back at home to their relatives. It was a very serious issue. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, right here. Um, hi, I have a documentary that took 14 years to make. And I was wondering if you could talk about the process of making that do you have any advice on distribution? Um, that, so you have a documentary that's that, uh, took 14 years, years yeah. and, and so do you have any advice now? You've been, you've been circulating it through festivals. Do you have any advice about how to distribute it? Yes. Do I get that right? Yes. Uh, sadly, I can't give you any advice about that. It's not really my field of expertise, yeah. uh, distribution. Um, and the same, I say the same, really, uh, you know, people send me scripts and stuff. I don't 
I don't develop screenplays. I'm not really, I can't, you know, my voice is as good as your mom's or dad's or brother's, you know. <laughs> if you like it, you like it. I mean, I can't really do anything for folks in that regard. I, I work in a specific right. area. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, I'll we'll give some money. Yes, uh, early on, how do you think your job influenced your family? Well, I was lucky. I married a wonderful woman who has been incredibly supportive of me since uh, since I started in the industry, and I think that uh, you know uh, the business is rife with uh, broken marriages. So uh, I just happen to have gotten very lucky. I think. In my career, I've made a very strong effort, I think, to get home as frequently as possible. Uh, you know, not to like pat myself on the back, but you know, I worked in Montreal, it's a five or six hour drive. I would make it every weekend. Uh, and <laughs> well, we have three great kids, so I guess it, it worked. However it, however it happened between the two of us, we made it work. But it's, uh, it, it, it does take a little extra work to get back and forth and not be away for long. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to steal the floor again, but do you have a movie that you just wish you could have gotten your hands on and passed? You wish you could have been involved in? Um, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's jobs I haven't gotten that I would have liked to have gotten that I probably wouldn't name, but you know, there's, you know, there's times he'd like to, you know, I'd like to stay with Scorsese every time he works and, you know, he has different choices he can make and times work out differently and things like that. So, um, I don't know if I have any one particular project. Then, um, Chris, you take the executive producer credit as the line producer. Do you take the UPM credit? I don't. No. Do you have a UPM that you work with? I do, yes, two, two women that I work with closely. Uh, uh, there, there's a, uh, yeah, and you know why that UPM credit is taken uh, by line producers? Directors guild. Uh, yeah, residuals. Yeah, they, the question really is about. Uh, you'll see a lot of times executive producers will take. Uh, they'll be in the the main title and then they'll show up as a as a unit production manager, and uh, you need um, the directors guild, which I'm a member. Uh, provides residuals as does the Screen Actors Guild if you're if you've worked on a movie. So. Um, a production manager and the first assistant director and the second assistant director will get some kind of back end payments from DVD sales or something like that. And it's, it's not bad, it's good, you know, it's decent money for people. But um, my production manager, I don't generally take that credit because it would be taking residuals from my production manager. Sure. Because if there was a hundred bucks available for a production manager residual, 50 would go to me and I'm already paid more than the production manager. So I tend to, I have one woman particularly two that I work with who I consider the best in the business and I think that it would be I wouldn't have them if I was uh, I, it feels greedy honestly but I, I have to say 80% of the business does it you, you, you rarely see particularly on the comic book movies which generate so much income uh, that uh, there's you know anyway yes what's the um, lowest budget film that you've done recently and um, how much did agents um, uh, pressure you and, and and the people you hire not to lower your fees for um, like indie films. Um, and for instance, like if you, you saw somebody that you're hiring and you let that agent just, um, that guy just lower his fee for somebody else, do you like go after him because you think you can get him lower? No, I think the, um, the question really is about fees and uh, the, the lowest I've done was the Argo uh, in recent years, uh, which was 47 million. But, uh, and you know, movies cost a lot, so it's not like it, it's, and would I lower my fee for a, a project? Sure, and it doesn't necessarily have to follow you, um, but it would have to be something specific because most of us establish a lifestyle, kids, and, you know, whatever it is. You don't, you wouldn't do it casually. You'd have to, and because it takes essentially nine months or a year of your life, you want to, you know, I I tend to try to bet on a winner. It's I, I'm not young enough to just be able to risk it, you know, and say, well, I'll try this young director and take cut my fee and hope it all works out for the best because it could be. It doesn't work, and it, you know, so if I can, I try to stay with, you know, what I think is somebody that the industry thinks is somebody going somewhere or is there. If I can. Would your agent mind? Like, would your agent mind if you just really wanted? No, project? no. I'm I'm in charge of all of that. I'm you know I mean you have an agent, they, but it doesn't. You know, your person, he agrees with basically whatever I tell him. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I really want to do it. Yeah, I don't think you should, you know. Or, you know, I really want to do it. Yeah, it's a great idea. You know? <laughs>
It's like an art form. It's like a really funny. Uh, I always find myself, and I've had the same guy for a long time. We're good, for, you know, we're friends, and I'm like, and when Wendy, Wendy will say, "What did Paul say?" I said, "He agreed with me." <laughs> you know, what did you tell him? Whatever I tell him, he agreed with me. We have time for three more questions. Give me one, two, and we'll take the third in just a moment. So go ahead. I just want to know if you're doing your dream job, and if not, well, what is it? Oh, you mean in terms of like a movie or what I do? Your career. Yeah. My career. Uh, no, I would say if I had a dream job, it would have been to produce films rather than to be a line producer. And rather than work for a producer, I would have liked to have produced my own films and been in, you know, ideas that I had for films that I thought were great ideas and see them become movies. So, about it, I don't, uh, I'm completely satisfied with my career in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, I'm fulfilled with what I do. I enjoy going to work. I, I feel blessed, really, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm lucky. I'm, I wouldn't for a moment say, oh, you know, you know I'm lucky. So I take, take what I have and be grateful for it, for sure. So. Yes, sir. It sounds like once you have a budget plan constructed, you don't have a lot of flexibility in it. But you, you do. You do. You do. You, you build it in. You, like you the percentage of margin for error that you build in. Is there a like target percentage? Um, well, what you're doing in, when you build a budget is you're, you're, you're creating a little bit of flexibility inside of it. And again, not any of it is really known to anybody. So had we had to bump up those extras, I would have found the money somewhere, somehow. But it becomes sort of, as you're getting closer and closer, it's easy in the beginning, because you, you say you're shooting for 15 weeks. The first two, three, four, five, six, you're on budget. You haven't really spent all of it. So you can always you know, kind of reel some money back in if you think you have to. But um, it, there's a little flexibility built in to allow for the ups and downs which come, because they do come all the time. You know, it's, it's, I use a bad example, but it's like a soundboard, you know? And <coughs> you, 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 it's like a, you've got a lot of uh, different things. You're moving things all the time, and really, you're doing it within a small group because no one else really has all that information. So you're, you're orchestrating in a way that uh, with experience and knowledge, you hope that it will go the way you want it to. I mean, on Argo, we came in a half a million dollars under, which was great. And on Noah, we came a million dollars over. But we were a week over. So, you know, so, okay, so you went a million over. It went a million over on 125. It wasn't terrible. But it's still not what anyone wants me to report back to the studio. You know, you're like... Right. And again, it's one of those things talking about what I do is you're trying to give foreknowledge to the studio so that you're not saying to them on, on you know, the day before you finish, oh, by the way, we're going to go a million over, which can happen. <laughs> but, you know, because you're reporting them all every, there's cost reports, you know, basically every week you're, you're tracking all your costs. Everything's computerized. The budget on Inception was 450 pages. So, you know, it's a document that has a team of 15 accountants. It's all being monitored. You know, we're getting reports. We can look at them very quickly and kind of go, well, you know, we put 100 in here, and now it's 75. And we have a quarter of the movie left, so that seems like that will cover us. You know, you do that for each line. It takes time. But you're tracking everything. So um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised, but it can happen. It can happen. So. One last question. Yes, ma'am. Marcus, I'd like to know if on Argo and Noah, are you shooting on film or digital? We shot film on, uh, on Noah. I haven't really made a digital movie yet because the oh. filmmakers I've worked with haven't converted yet. So do you download at the end of the day? I mean, is that part of the schedule that you make time to download the dailies? The dailies will go to the lab and be processed and then be shown the next day, depending on what the director's choice was. In the old days, you'd see them Mondays work Tuesday night uh -huh. or, or something like that. You know, you'd go to the lab and watch them at the lab, and now they, it's DVD. And you know the director can choose to watch. Like Chris Nolan watches them every day in the trailer. We had a we had a trailer with a screening room in it that traveled with us, so he would watch them with his cinematographer, so that they could talk about stuff. And his editor, you know, they sit in the front row or whatever, and they kind of, you know, they have selects. So if we've done, you know, ten takes of something, they, he circled them the day before. I like takes three, four, and seven, and then he'll tell the editor, you know, and the editor's doing a rough assembly during the course of shooting. So. And then other guys will take the DVD home and watch them in the weekend, and no one will see them with him. You know, and you can have your own. I can get my own copy of the dailies and watch them, or you can watch them over the net. They have secure sites with passwords, and we can watch them on the internet. But uh, uh, it, you know, it's different. Everybody's seen it different. I'm happy to go more if you, you want. Yeah, okay. no problem. We'll take a few more then, Chris. If any, Chris yeah. You obviously love movies a lot. So, what is your favorite? Movie? Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> 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 what? You want to Google that? Get back to us. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, you know, I mean, obviously, The Godfather and, you know, all those. I mean, there's so many great movies, right? Just like, yeah, so. Um, you spoke a little bit about your large team in pre-production as well as in production. Yeah. Would you um, mind just kind of breaking it down um, briefly? Yes. Uh, she asked about, so you talked about your, your large team in, in pre-production and production. Could you break it down and give us a little more, a little more info? Yeah, and if it shifts. And does it shift? Um, well, it's sort of like any uh, sort of corporate chart, I guess, sort of. You know, you have, you have the producer and then me and then the production manager. And then that production manager basically manages all the departments. So you have a, the costumes, the sets, the you know, construction, transportation locations, props. Everyone's allocated a little bit of money, and then it's all managed. And so the, the key, let's say it's simple, but let's say the key hair person, right? They're given $25,000 for a wig allowance for the movie or beards or fake beards or something. You know, they, my production manager will interact with them. You know, they'll come in with a purchase order, they'll come in with something and say, we want to order $40,000 worth of wigs. We, we talked about, you know, that kind of thing. So it's sort of like we, we are the production team managing uh, the, each department. And then they self-manage themselves, and one of them will report back to us. But you have, you know, like a location manager who's out making, if you're going to shoot here in this building, you know, someone has to arrange all the parking and the catering and the, where you're going to eat and where you're going to put the extras and where they're going to, you know, all that kind of stuff. So he has a batch of money. So really you're just sort of managing all them and making sure that when you get there because it all smooths, flows smoothly. Because time is money really applies to the film industry. Because again, as I said, everyone's unionized. Everything's on the clock, you know. After eight hours, you're in time and a half. After 12, you're in double. After, you know, after, after 14, you're in two and a half times. And if you don't eat in six hours, you're paying a meal penalty. I mean, it's a clock that's ticking. And that's where <laughs> directors get sensitive and where it gets you know, where you have to kind of help them manage their day in a way that, because usually what happens is you get not much done in the morning and then you're racing in the afternoon. And uh, so. Yeah. Uh, these days, everybody has a video camera and everybody's shooting lots of life and reality and people writing and producing their micro budgets. And there's, so there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of interesting stuff. Do you see that as, some of these projects being a pathway towards legitimate movie sure. making. Sure, sure. I think so. I think it's. I think it's a. I think it's a steep hill. It always is, and you know when you have, um, you know that many people trying to get into one industry. I mean, so I think that absolutely, like young directors do, a uh, short film or something. Sure, get into a film festival. I do think that at the end of the day, the talent is really what determines everything. And again, just talking about my son, yeah, he wants to be a chairman. My wife and I talk about it. Does he have the talent? I don't know if he has the talent. He has to find out if he has the talent, you know, because you can't fake it. At the end of the day, you either can deliver or you can't. Either your work is good and you're able to, to get there or you're not, you know, whether you're, uh, and I think that's, cream rises to the top. So you, anyone can make them, but not everyone is talented. So. Not to discourage anyone, but it's sort of like, I wanted to be a producer. The skills required to be a producer, I didn't have. That's the way it goes. So I do what I do, and that's, that's okay. So some people may want to be in feature films and may find themselves in TV, or may want to be in TV and find themselves in commercials, because they're, it's just, uh, or set out to be a cameraman and end up being a camera assistant. You know, that, that, it's, it's all kind of what, you're, what you put into it and what you really have for talent. Yes, sir. Um, so do you use a lot of product management software? Um, how much does that help you in your job? And what you're yeah, there is, there is a program, Movie Magic Budgeting and Movie Magic Scheduling, or EP has its companies called. And yeah, it's a standardized uh, software program to budget and to schedule. And uh, everybody uses it. Uh, it's, 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 yeah. How do you break into the job of being an executive? The question is, how do you break into the job of being an executive producer? Uh, in, it, in my capacity as an ex I mean, there's a, I, I, I don't know if you were earlier, but there were six on Argo, and each came at it from a different place. One guy came at it, uh, was a, he's a hedge fund guy in Texas. Uh, another young lady went to an Ivy League school and works, uh, helped develop the screenplay. Another started out as Ben Affleck's assistant and worked with him for a long time. Um, me, personally, I started out as we talked about earlier, as a production assistant, and just worked my way up 
rung by rung by rung. Just kept expanding the size of what I did until I had a body of work. You know, I was always trying to get, you know, just keep moving myself along and try to get a little bit more responsibility, a bigger job. And then, uh, you know, you, you, the more experience you have, the quicker you can get there. We'll take three more. You, you, and then the back, and then we will have to wrap up. Yep. You mentioned some of your own ideas. I am, like, pursuing. Have you ever pursued any of your own? I did until I had my second child, and then I got, uh, I got, I got, <laughs> It was hard, you know what I mean? Because to be a producer, you have to, you have to devote. I mean, first of all, there aren't as many movies being made anymore, right? And many of them are being made for international audiences. So many of them are from, you know, the, the genre of G.I. Joe and uh, Spider-Man. And they're, they're big, wide open pictures to a mass audience. There aren't that many of them. They're all controlled. If you, if you try to get a good book, it's gone, you know? Uh, ben Affleck, I think, and I hope is going to do this new Dennis Lehane book. I'm sure he bought it when it was, you know, probably went out printed, you know, or DiCaprio did, I think, where he gave it to him. It's just hard to get a hold of material. And in that time, you know, you're, I never really wanted to live in L.A., to be honest with you. That was another problem. For me personally, I never, L.A. never appealed to me. It's, it's not less so now. I enjoy it a little bit more now. But when I was younger, I just, I felt out of place there. So I think you have to be there. You have to kind of hustle. You have to be an entrepreneur. You have to take risk, you know. So it's harder. As I got turned 30, 35, I couldn't really, I didn't have the flexibility anymore. I was developing a career. That, that little thing I was doing, going bigger and bigger, was working. So to stop that and to step out and take six months or a year to risk something, I did, I did write some things, I pitched some things, I didn't go anywhere. So I just, I, I, I kept doing this thing and it worked. So I stayed, I stayed there. And you know, I think, it's, you know, there are, it's, 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 a, it's a tough, tough business to get, uh, to be a producer. It's hard. And you need money behind you. you know. Um, from like Hollywood having the big studio lots and whatnot, like, uh, do you find it, I guess, cheaper or more expensive to be in the studio lot versus location? And what, how does that have any kind of work with the director and the uh, I think that's a good question. You're, you're um, about working in studios being more expensive. Anytime you work in a studio, it's more expensive. And it's more expensive basically because <clears throat> uh, you're. It, it's some of the mechanics of the job, but basically you're going to put lighting in up above. You're going to put a grid in, and you're going to put lights in above. For some strange reason, this same room, you could shoot with cameras on the ground and lights off the ceiling if you came in here, but if you go in the studio, they're going to put a grid up, they're going to put them on motors so they can go up. It's going to be, it just gets more elaborate. Sometimes, practically speaking, you need to build. You know, like on Shutter Island, we had to build this prison. It's very specific, you know, so we built, we built, you know, we built the prison, and um, certain sets you build, but generally speaking, Depending on the kind of movie you're making, you know. I mean, they're making Captain America too in L.A. I think it's, you know, 50% sets. You know, it's spaceships or whatever. You know, that kind of thing. So you, but if you don't, if you don't have a lot of money, I was recently involved in in trying to budget a movie for somebody, and if you don't have a lot of money, you're going to go on location. It'll be quicker. It'll be cheaper than building sets. Last question in the back. Um, you may have recognition this. I came in a little late. I apologize, but. Um, you mentioned the turning point when people started coming to you versus you seeking them out. Maybe that never changes. Um, but also, um, how that's affected by your decision not to live in LA? And also, are you really as good as your last picture? Or <laughs> 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 um, I, I, let me see if I can answer that question. I mean, in the, in the, as good as your last picture, I mean, obviously, the, uh, there is a prejudice if you work on good movies, no matter how good you are. People are predisposed to think, oh, he worked on uh, this, he must be great. It's not always true. So I do think, though, because of what I talked about earlier with people making phone calls, that you, if people make phone calls and you don't check out, no matter what the picture did, because I work, I work with money and with people, and if you're not good at either of those, then it's pretty, it doesn't matter what the movie did. It does help to get, you, you know, like, this thing with Argo, you know, people are like, oh, Inception, you know, like, it's like, it's not, like, you know, it's not, take it easy, all right? It's just, I, I also did Tomb of the Emperor Dragon, Mummy 3, did you see that? You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I try to remind you, just take it, you know, it's like, it's great, I got lucky, but it's not always, you know, it's not always like that, and, uh, and I think that, um, you know, so what was the first part of your question? I'm sorry. When the tide turned, when people actually started coming to you, and can I be honest? It hasn't really turned. I mean, it hasn't. It hasn't. I mean, I still have uh, 
plenty of competition. I mean, I am out of work for four months now. It's not like the phone rang off the hook as soon as Argo was over, like, oh, let's get, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's just, fortunately for me, at my age, I've been at it long enough, I know the rhythm, so you work for a year, and you're off for two, three, four, five months, sometimes six, you go back, you know, it always happens, you know, it's like, but it isn't, uh, it isn't sort of like I'm just fielding calls saying yes, no, yes, no, it's like, if, I, if, if there's something out there, I'm gonna have to work to get it, unless it's somebody I've worked with before, I'm not gonna be instantly hired because there are plenty of people that do what I do well, men and women that do what I do well. And for any young women in the audience, I recommend the film industry. I think it's a great industry, not to sidetrack, but I think it's a great industry for women because it's really not about, you know, sort of a male world. It's about if you if you can identify good movies and you 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 know you have a skill to find what uh, those movies are, then like a, my daughter is, I'm encouraging her to try to go into this end of the industry as a producer because I. It's a great industry for women, you know, there's, so anyway, sidetrack. Um, so what is your strength and what is your weakness? Oh. Uh, I think my strength is I get along with people, honestly. At the end of the day, that's my strength, is that I tend to get along with people and uh, all kinds of people. And I think that that's a big, that's a big benefit. And I think I have a, a, a reasonably good handle on money. Um, you know, I'm not like a math genius, but I can, I, I can, I have a feel for money in a way that's compact and 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 it functions well within the industry. Those two skills are really are really beneficial to do what I do. As far as a weakness, yeah, my wife can answer that question. No, I know. I of course not. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? I think that uh, I think that uh, I can be a bit of a, a dog with a bone, you know. If I have an idea or if I have a thought about something, I don't back down, and I should sometimes, you know, where you just sort of like push your idea too hard. I mean, in Argo, there was some conflict in times because, you know, going into Turkey was a very big deal. You know, we, into Istanbul, Istanbul didn't have a film industry to speak of, and we put our trust in a local guy there and his wife, and uh, and they pulled it off beautifully for us, but it was, there was a lot of logistics that went into shooting there for three weeks, and closing down streets and changing signs. It was a big deal for us. And, you know, in trying to get that through to my, my uh, team that were, you know, that we, done, we did all the work. We laid it all out. We had everything going. And I would call a meeting and try to explain to people. And it created tension because someone was like, we don't want to hear about it. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, but I thought the success, I was convinced that the success of the picture of, of our of our shooting there was relying on them understanding what it took to get there and that and that if this is what we did to get there you know and so uh, things like the extras for example I mean those those extras were you know Ben has made jokes about it on camera he said it was a student revolution but everybody who was willing was an extra was over 60 because <laughs> they all they were the ones who would work for 15 bucks a day but just saying, let's pay them all 35 bucks and get everyone under 25 would not have guaranteed 1,300 people would have shown up that day. That was just the reality. And uh, fortunately, the movie isn't being criticized because the folks are older. No one's paying any attention to it. But at the time, it was, you know, so I think as a weakness, one thing I always have to do is be careful of, uh, you, know, you know, not locking in on some things because I can lock in. We could go all day, and I know we'd like to, but uh, we, we are going to wrap it up here. You guys. I'm here if anyone wants to ask any questions. Thank you.